Hello everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. And today we are going to talk about a new research paper on cross-modal learning for chemistry property prediction lang large language models meet graph machine learning. So what this paper is really about, uh, it is about integrating large language models and graph neural networks to predict chemical properties, right? So if you are uh, interested in predicting anything, right, anything that relates to chemistry, such as a uh, drug toxicity, energy of a molecule, this is the paper for you, right? Um, so yeah, and it's also directly related to my area of research. So why don't we take a look into the abstract for now, shall we? So, okay. In chemistry, the objective is to make molecules with the desired properties, right? So, the, so if you're, right, so, so better it be in like material design or drug design, this is typically what you want to do, right? So, so that we can get accurate property predictions for, for things such as material design and drug screening. However, right, existing graph neural networks, right, they are not that accurate, unfortunately, right? And because it's not that accurate, it leads to a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of cost, if I would say, say so, right? So, so how about this? Say, how about if we integrate some of those um, LLMs, right, and see if if we can compensate for the lack of uh, accuracy of graph neural networks, and that's what they are trying to do, right? And they call this approach MMF, right? It stands for multimodal fusion, right? So. So that's the idea, right? So the idea is that the GNNs is able to model the graph topology of the molecule, right? Whereas we can combine N, we can combine the zero shot and few, few, few shot of the LMs, right? Output, and if we combine them together, we should be able to make the entire model generalizable across unseen um, test set, right? So, so yeah, yeah, and it also addressed the problem of the distribution changing over, over time, so perhaps this large language model approach can help in solving that or, or helping out in some cases. Okay, so this is a NeurIPS paper, uh, it's a workshop paper, uh, and it's quite long, but but let's go to the the conclusion first. Okay, if there is one right here, there should be a, a conclusion somewhere around here. Um, there's a lot of results. Okay, let's see if the conclusion offers anything new, because it usually doesn't. Okay, right. It it doesn't, right? It just does not. But that's not really a problem. Okay, so so let's just get straight into the introduction right now, shall we? Okay, so okay, so we have a graph neural networks that can learn nonlinear topological structures of the molecules, and then it can be useful for drug design, material design, and so on. And there are a couple of them, namely message passing neural networks, SysNet, ENGGN, DiamondNet++, and SphereNet. So all of these different GNN models, they are not your typical G GNN models. In fact, they are, how should I say, a more specialized, it is chemist, uh, it is specialized in predicting chemical properties, right? So the architectures, they are not general, right? It's only applicable for 3D molecules, the, especially for uh, SysNet, DimeNet, and SphereNet. But what they are trying to say is that, yes, they are specialized, but they are often 
um, but they often have, have these uh, underlying issues, right? Such as low accuracy and um, it has over squashing and over smoothing, right? Right. So over smoothing is when the, the atom node representations converge to the same representation values, right? And in, in that case, right, the neural network cannot distinguish what atoms are what, right? So because all of them become the same thing, which is something that you do not want in your neural network, right? But as for over squishing, right, if I can allow myself to ask an expert here, right? So GNN over squishing, sorry for the spelling could be wrong but either way okay so over squishing is is when the important information is excessively compressed as it propagates through the layers of neural networks yep so so it's something like over smoothing right but but in this case right here the more layers the information passes through the more of its crucial information gets diminished right it gets com compressed in general, right? So, so typically, in order to combat these problems, you would only want your neural network to be like two layers, three, three layers, and maximum is like six layers at most, right? But LLMs, on the other hand, doesn't suffer this same issue. In fact, it is able to, in fact, it is able to expand up to like hundreds of of layers and, and a lot of parameters in general, right? So it would be nice if we can use LLMs uh, instead of GNNs for molecular property predictions because of that um, mathematical structure, right? So here they, here they say LLMs have revolutionized NLP and and there's a lot of um, multimodal learning, right? Alongside with, with like chain of thought, right? Few shot in context learning. Those are some prompt engineering strategies that you can use to make the LMs work better for your tasks, right? And uh, yeah, and I don't need to go go through each and one of the of the problem strategy because um, you will see it in just a second, right? So yeah, so obviously the application of foundational LLMs, right, is already being explored like like a lot of times already. But the fact that what is surprising, right, and I checked this before, is that there's not much work being done in like predicting molecular property using both LLMs and GNNs, right? So in this paper, this is their um, their way of doing it, right? For the first time, they say. So, okay. So what the LLMs can offer is that it can encode molecular information explicitly, right? Because they already have, to have, have this uh, molecular insight in molecular chemistry, right, then there should be a way to use it to, to, to compensate for the weaknesses of uh, GNNs. So, okay, and that's what they aim to do. So right now, let's go straight ahead to the methods here. All right, so, okay, so the they define molecular graph as just like a collection of atoms and some bonds in between. Well, the bonds are usually defined by by using a radius cutoff function where you define a bond within like five five angstrom or lower. It it depends, right? It depends on on its impact on the accuracy, right? So, okay, so you have the H matrix and so on and so forth, the adjacency matrix, right? So that's not really that important, right? But but right here, there's a lot of details here, okay? Let, a lot of notations here. Let DL be the la labeled data set containing a set of graphs, right? With a set of properties associated to those graphs. 
and okay, right. So that's label data set, and we have a graph encoder, which is the F gamma G, right, which creates H G, right, which is the graph level embeddings. And then we have the pre-trained large language models, which is F theta prime S E leading to some kind of like text embedding here. Right, so SE is the technical descriptions generated by zero shot uh, chain of thought prompting of LMs on molecular crabs G, right, in order to produce text level embedding. Right. So and next they have a few few shot uh, uh, in context learning prompting, right? Uh, with a few input output pairs. So basically with in context learning is that in right is that you need to provide it with, with some examples of both the molecular st st structure text and also the uh, property output text right and you can get a few pairs of them into the LLM and then if you try to understand oh yeah you're talking about like okay well let's say right you give it a bunch of examples like oh yeah Right, the benzene molecule should be associated with with some kind of like a, a free or free energy property, right? In terms of elect electron volts or something like that, right? So you, you give it some examples and then you ask it the actual que question and it will give you the answer in the form of a predictive embedding HICL. Okay, and now here's the important part here, is that um, the joint optimization objective function, right, is defined as minimizing the regression loss, LG, using this supervised learning approach. So what they basically want uh, to do is to have some kind of a system that takes in the these three different embeddings, right? One is from the graph, Right, graph neural network, and the other one is from the zero shot LLM, and the, and the final one is from the in context learning uh, uh, LLM output. And they have this uh, PI, which I think stands for property, right? So for a given property value, right? So that's your, so PI is the truth label, while G. G W here, right, right. This one we we produce the prediction value of the uh, property of the molecule, right. So and you try to try to minimize this loss function here. So as you can see right here in Figure One, it it just shows it to you bluntly, right. You have okay. So you start out with a chemical smell strings right so you make it into a molecular graph which you feed in into the gnn right and at the same time you feed it into uh an llm right but in the form of some kind of a zero shot cot prom and a few shot icl prom which you can then feed in into the lm to produce some kind of a text output here in terms of a textual explanation and top rank predictions yeah and an x is that okay and then you fit into another language model right and i assume this is uh, to to convert the text into uh vectors embedding vectors right since since the output from the gnn is going to be an embedding vector as well that's why you need this kind of conversion process and then you somehow need to combine all three of them and then you feed it into a mixture of experts MOE. So for those uh, of you who don't know what mixture of experts is, it is basically right. If you imagine uh, uh, a data distribution, right? So there's like different data, right, in uh, the data space, right, in the data set. So so you most likely, right, what you want to do, right. Is that you can allocate and uh, individual expert networks, right, to select okay 
should I uh, should I be responsible for processing that type of data, that cluster of data, or should I be assigned to the other cluster of data? So you have this kind of like specialization, right? Uh, 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 by just having these expert neural networks to be really good and proficient at something very specific, right? And when you have multiple of them, that's what mixture of expert is. And uh, in this case, right, they are using it, right? So they might have some kind of, of like a system where two different experts, right? Right, one is responsible for for the cross modal fusion outputs, and the other one is for the text outputs solely, right? And when you combine, when you take the average or the, or the sum of the experts' output, that's your final molecular property prediction value. But let's read a bit closer here, okay, shall we? So, okay, uh, our framework uses, okay, LMs, blah, 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 blah. Okay, firstly, it introduces semantic fusion strategy that, that leverages zero shot um, along with the GNNs. Okay, I already talked about that. And it also in incorporates uh, in-context learning, right, okay. And to say this helps uh, to so that we don't need to explicitly fine tune on labeled data, right? So there are no gradients going through the LLM. It's all frozen. Sorry, we just heard some noise. Okay, and lastly, it employs a mixture of experts that integrates the cross modal and prediction embeddings through a gating mechanism, right? So there is a gating mechanism to select which expert to use. In this case, I would say that the expert, right, this would be uh, expert one, and this would be expert zero, if I'm not mistaken here. So, um, okay, right, and uh, optimizes uh, the unified embeddings, right, which you can use, obviously. Okay, and to say, it is important to note it, that we do not customize LLMs through fine tuning. Instead, we access our LLMs using the mass uh, platform, uh, L, L mass platform by uh, using text-based API interaction. Okay, right. What is that? What is that? Let's see. Okay, language model as a service, right? All right. So basically, just chat GBT API, All right? kind of expensive it will be ex expensive but pretty sure they got all the money here to do this kind of thing so okay uh right 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 now they are going to specify what kind of uh, graph neural network they are going going to use right the lm is cool but we still need a solid gnn to work with and yeah and this is what they're using right here. So instead of your usual graph convolutional neural network, right, they're using uh, uh, this newer approach called graph shabby shift. Okay, is it called shabby shift? Mm, let me check. Pronunciation. Shabby shift. Shabby shift. Shabby shift. Uh huh. Let me see. Oh, sorry, man. I'm going on YouTube right now. Russia, kelembutan waktu. Gentle, gentle care. Okay, sorry about that. We are looking at how to pronounce these names as well as how to say more interesting and often confusing. Russian name, make sure to stay tuned. But once you know, we are Chubushov. But once you know, Chubushov. Chubushov. Okay, right, so it's called Graph Chubushov. Okay, so uh, Graph Chubushov convolution, right? Okay, so whatever that is, right? So so uh, Graph convolution Chubushov. Chubushov. Okay, right. It's a scalable alternative to spectral convolution that offers locality in capturing local graph-based 
features, flexibility in approximating spectral properties and scalability through recursive Laplacian computation. Look, this is really complicated, right? Uh, oh, okay, I will admit this kind of stuff, it requires more time to un un understand. And this is my first time looking through this pa paper. So let's see if the details are that important in this case, which I don't think so, because the novelty of this approach really is about the LLM, not really about this uh, a new graph neural network, right? But either, either way, okay, if you are interested in it, please do check out the paper. Um, okay, and the equation for that graph convolution operation is this right here. I'm not going to go through that because if we were to do this, it would take quite some time to like un understand all, all of it. But here, okay, right. So assuming it creates some kind, let's treat it as a black box for now. Okay, so okay, in summary, the layer-wise differential neural operator maps discrete graphs to a node-level uh, embedding matrix, HGCC, right? that maximally captures both topology and feature information embedded within the graphs. We perform global graph pooling using set-to-set -set algorithm. Okay, so for those of you who do not know what set-to-set -set algorithm is, it is basically kind of like a, a, an encoder-decoder transformer, right? But it is more like treating the the tokens in an unordered state it's kind of like yeah you basically take a set right of, of, of tokens where the order doesn't really matter and you create and you output another set containing some kind of like process information right and and typically it is a pooling method right so you are transforming a set of objects into a smaller set of objects with that pooling mechanism using set to set, right? So, okay, but now here's the important part. Um, okay, the language models, right? So, okay, so, and to say, L LRMs adopt a pre-trained prompt and predict approach, right? And it's pretty good at that. So there's bird, deep, Diberta, okay. Right. So obviously with with uh, encoder based LLMs, right? <laughs> right. Here. Right. Yeah, it doesn't have those reasoning ca uh, capabilities, right? So let's see, what else did I have to say? So there's a lot of fluff in here. Okay, right here. It says, while it may seem intuitive to use LLMs for interpreting smiles, right? Smiles is a, a text uh, formula, right? A one-dimensional text formula uh, to represent a molecule, right? So, okay, their effectiveness is still in its early stage, right? LLMs have been proven to be effective uh, uh, in, uh, in zero-shot and ICL few-shot learning, right? So, okay, and I explained a whole bunch of things about uh, a zero shot and ICL, right? But that's not really uh, that interesting for us, right? We can obviously skip a lot of them here since, since they are mainly catering this to a chemistry audience. But I would assume you, you guys should already know that, right? If you don't know, please do check out some other YouTubers video. I don't cover that here, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it's just my way because I'm lazy right now. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, evaluation. Okay, right. Right. So they use three representative LLMs, Tex Da Vinci. Right, if you don't remember what Tex Da Vinci is, it is basically the original Ch GPT-3 model, right? Right, it used to be the largest uh, GPT model out there, right? At that time, we have like GPT-J and uh, so on. There, there isn't really much 
options at at that time. Yeah, but nowadays we have like llama, you know, and then、uh, a lot of different variations, dolphin models, even right. But either way, okay. Uh, GPT three, Chat GPT, and Bart. Okay, and now. Okay, let's see. Okay, chatbot, blah blah, and then talk about the common parameters. Like, what's the top p hyper? Uh, what's the top p parameter? Right? What's the top k top p temp temperature, which isn't really that important in in this case. And then talk about a lot about the charges, right? And Bart is free. Yeah, I mean it's technically free, right? But we want to use the A A API to ac access Bar. You would probably have to like pay for it at some point. Um, but I don't really like this, right? I don't really like using APIs because that costs money. Okay, right. Okay, but here's the more important part. Okay, how they prompt the LM to do their zero shot um prediction. Right, so the problem is something like this. Problem one, okay. What is the molecular stru structure of the chemical small string? Could you describe its、uh, arrangement, bonds, atoms, fun functional groups? Problem two, what are the physical properties of the molecule? Its boiling point, melting point, and so on. What's the solubility, right? And then what's the chemical reactivity? Are there common re reactions that this molecule could undergo? What is the mechanism of these reactions, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of like prompts, a lot of questions in there. But I'm wondering if they would actually do some kind of like ablation study to see whether whether or not these prompts it would make make sense to include it, especially with prompt thirteen and prompt fourteen. I don't see how it's. <laughs> I don't see how these two prompts are really related. In any way, really, it would be a fast. It would be a stretch if it's related at all, right? So okay, I'm hearing noises. Um, let's see. Sorry, sorry about that. Just let me. Okay, all right. So okay, okay. Just give me one second. All right. Sorry for the interruption there. So let's get back to it, shall we? So okay, so in this section right here, they're discussing about how to integrate those、uh, text descriptions as additional features to improve,、uh, to improve the performance of the overall model. So it involves some kind of a fine tuning process, they say. But let's see about that, shall we? Okay. So、uh, part one, fine tuning. Language models and domain-specific customization. So they use a small language model, small pre-trained language model, and they want to encode the text outputs from the LLM right into a vector, right? Exactly like here, exactly formulated in this equation right here, just to convert the text into a embedding vector. Right, so, so, so for this part, they really have have to fine tune the small language model, right? Okay, so during fine tuning, the small language model extracts informative features from the generated descriptions for task specific customizations. Okay, so it it serves as an intermediate layer between the LM and the downstream prediction layers. Okay, so this small model has to be fine tuned, obviously, right? But but I don't think it's that necessary, right? Um, I mean, cause like. There are there are things like a sentence bird which you can immediately use without any kind of fine tuning, so I I wonder about that. Okay, but either way, right? So you you can generate a 
the contextualized embeddings, right? Where M represents the number of tokens, blah, blah, blah. To encode the, the explanations into a fixed slang vector, they apply a softmax attention pooling mechanism to calculate the weighted sum of the token embeddings. Okay, uh, this results in a comprehensive representation of the, of the entire text description. Yeah, so uh, so essentially, but if you're using a sentence uh, bird, this is not really necessary. So I recommend if we check this thing out, sentence transformer is on hugging face, right? If we use this, then, then we don't necessarily have to do this, this kind of work at all so that we can bypass this fine-tuning process. Right. So, okay, but e anyway, right? And to say, oh yeah, h text, the uh, director of the text explains, uh, enhances explainability by, um, okay, so basically, it, yeah, it's just text anyway. Um, okay. Right here. Next part, few shot LM prompting. So uh, in context learning, uh, okay, so they're talking about ICL again, right? So, okay, there are some fancy notation here, right? Mm. Uh, P test drawn from the probability distribution of a P test given a uh, a uh, graph train, P train, and a uh, graph test. Okay. Oh yeah. Right. This tilde represents the decoding strategy. Mm, okay. Right. To examine how quality and quantity of these uh, ICL demonstrations impact the, the property prediction task, they investigate two distinct uh, ICL sampling strategies. One is called random, and the other one is called scaffold. And I assume they will be explaining it. So the quality of demonstrations is determined by the strategies used to identify the top K. Okay, so they are trying to identify the the top most uh the top similar uh input and output pair that are similar with the ones that the model is currently dealing with um yeah kind of similar to my idea but anyway uh to investigate the impact of the quantity of these demonstrations they have to optimize it for each query so okay and here's where they talk about the random strategy okay so the randomly sample k uh, pairs from the training data in this case they don't care about the similarity they're uh, randomly sample a few of them. But for scaffold, they use Tanimoto's similarity based on some fingerprints, right, in, in order to find the top K most similar chemical smiles, right? So the scaffold approach is essentially just similar similarity-based approach, right? So I think that's self-explanatory, right? So, okay. So in the say, this task we demonstrate whether or not the LM is able to predict this, these, these tasks based on its inherent knowledge simply by conditioning on, on the prompt, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, right, let's see. Okay, for each small query representation, the PLLM generate a C dimensional vector, which is H pre, pre, uh, predict I, where C signifies the dimension associated with multiple properties to be produced. Right. So essentially, this is the output. Right. This is the output. So let's say in Q, QM9, there is a total of the 12 properties. Properties, okay, and uh, yeah, if you have child properties, then your uh, h h predict uh, vector is gonna be length of child, right? 
So this vector is linearly encoded into a high dimensional space to produce a prediction embedding uh, HICL, right? And D represents uh, the embedding dimension. Uh, and we assume that C is significantly less than D, which it is in this case, right? So that's that. All right. And now they're going to talk about how they uh, perform that cross modal attention layer and also the final output layer. Okay, but let's take a look a bit further. All right, just two more pages on the methods. Got it. All right, so uh, okay. so I will assume that you guys know what uh, the attention mechanism is about, and I don't really have to explain it for this video, but okay. So okay, they, they compute the cross-modal embedding using a multi-head attention mechanism that uses the graph level embeddings and the text level embeddings. So, okay, so, and I say that if we do that, right, then we get a better representation, right? Do you, uh, because it allows each attention head to focus on uh, chemical bonds, functional groups, Mm. or even focusing on different parts of the, the text uh, descriptions, right? And there's a talk about semantic matching, which uh, basically means that, that uh, uh, individual heads, individual attention heads can specialize in aligning various semantic aspects, such as uh, functional groups in the molecular graph, with their corresponding text descriptions. For example, one attention head might specialize in, in uh, aromatic rings, uh, aligning aromatic rings with uh, textual descriptions, aligning with aromaticity. Okay, so basically it is doing some kind of a connection, uh, learn, learning between the graph uh, topology structure and the textual dis description, right? So, so they're implying that there is some kind of a contrastive learning algorithm in the, inside these attention mechanism, but these are just intuitions not actually being mathematically proven, right? So I wouldn't trust too much on that. Those are just intuitions anyway. Okay, and the last part to say is that it will help to increase the context sensitivity of the model. So, and what do they mean by that exactly? So, and they say molecules often behave differently depending on their context. For example, the reactivity of a molecule can change based on its surrounding environment. And this information might be uh, captured in the text, in textual description descriptions, description, sorry, yeah, in textual descriptions, right? So, okay, so it allows the model to be sensitive to this kind of context, which you can't necessarily get from the graph topology. Um, and I would assume this kind of thing is a uh, capture in like prom 13 and prom 4, 14 but I'm not entirely sure about this case right here. Then usually for QM9, the environment is about the same, really. It's just uh, uh, simulations, uh, it's just prop properties in a vacuum, right? So I don't really understand, not convinced. I'm not that convinced about this part right here. All right. Hmm. So if you have any other ideas about what they actually meant by this, please do let me know down in the comments. But either way, we shall move on. So, okay. So, okay, to be sensitive. Okay, and they say it's uh, beneficial for complex tasks, but they don't really explain any, anything other than just a brief description, okay. Uh, in summary, blah, blah, okay, it's parallel, yep, everyone knows that, um, okay, and they uh, describe how multi-hit 
attention mechanism works, but I will just quickly go through it. So you apply the multi hit attention mechanism uh, uh, for all the text embeddings, right? And then, okay. And then what they say here is that, okay, they concatenate the keys and values from the graph and text level embeddings. So both embeddings together as a single key and as a single value. In this case, right here, right. And they perform softmax attention to integrate all the information together and then hopefully to align them um, using this attention mechanism they apply the softmax operation here to generate the attention matrix which you can then apply it uh, into the unified value tensor right over here and that's pretty much it so okay right and that's that but for the output layer they use mixture of experts um, with a gating mechanism right so yeah, and then provide a brief description about what the uh, uh, MOE mechanism is, right? So so in here, they say each embedding, either cross-modal embeddings uh, from the attention mechanism or the prediction embeddings from the few shot prompting aims to maximize its contribution to, to the final prediction value, right? So, okay. So yeah, and it talk about how the gating uh, um, mechanism allocates weights based on the individual information, right? So, so if it finds out that the information from the LLM, uh, from the Fuchsia LLM is more useful than the cross-modal information is, it will allocate more weights to that, right? And, and, and that's exactly what I predicted here. So in that case, right, it would be, okay, so, so the gating function, so the gating mechanism is, is essentially by starting off with uh, uh, the, the creation of a gating vector, right? right? Which then you can then, uh, uh, okay, a weighting value called G, which then you can uh, apply it to either the ICL embedding or or this HFI embedding, and then you can do some kind of a weighting operation, right? So obviously, the higher the value G is, the more contribution is going to come from this HFI term right here to contribute towards the final prediction output. And that's MOE. Uh, uh, in this case, but this is a very old school uh, approach uh, for MOE, but but it works in this case, so that's fine. Um, all right, okay, and it talked about a whole bunch of things here about the data sets, which uh, in this case it's not really that important, and it's bloated. It, there's a lot of fluff in there. So, okay, we're just going to skip a ton of these things. Okay, let's skip some of them here. And let's get right into the meat of the results here. So, okay, uh, table two. Okay, so this is the experimental results of the framework's performance on QM8 dataset in comparison to the baseline algorithms in terms of mean absolute error metric, right? So the lower the mean absolute error, error is, the more accurate the models are. So in this case right here, we see that their approach, right, is clearly outperforming everything else in terms of uh, accuracy, right? So the lower the MAE is, the better it is, right? And uh, yeah, and they use 16 different input-output pairs uh, for the in-context learning prompt, right, which is reasonable. Um, and, and I'm not so sure if they stated what kind of GNN they use in this case. I would assume it's going to 
going to be a uh, uh, GG, uh, sorry, uh, a GCC, right? It's going to be GCC, but I'm not seeing it around here, uh, which is pretty concerning. Mm, I couldn't find it here. Okay, this is kind of bad already. And also the fact that there's like 16 different properties, right? But these are just the averages of the errors. So maybe it's in the supplementary, we will find out. But this is for Q QM8. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask where is the uh, G GCC model, right? Okay, and next, right, we have the QM9 results here. It's pretty similar uh, with table two, but in this case, right here, it's QM9, which is a larger data set compared to QM8. And in this case, it's outperforming all the other uh, models. Though surprisingly, they're not including DimeNet++, they're not even comparing it against the current state of the art. Something like uh, TorchMD and uh, SpearNet, which they mentioned, but they, they didn't include it. And most importantly, they didn't even include uh, GCC, right? Because like, the problem is, it, is that uh, if you don't include GCC, then you don't have a negative control, right? No negative control, which is the case of where you isolate out the LN, right? right? And you see how well does the GNN works in general. Only then we can truly know if the L LN actually helps or not, right? Otherwise, it could be just the fact that the GNN is already good enough on its own, and maybe the LLM is it, is it, it's just a branding for the paper, paper. We don't really know. Or maybe, yeah, so, so that's that. And that's a huge problem for me here. Um, let's see, but I'm, I'm more, yeah, so let's go through the technical details a bit more here, right? And they, and they do compare the the different LLM performance, and obviously, obviously, GPT four is going going to win. And you will be surprised to see this that using Google Bart is even worse than GPT three, which is, uh, yeah. Yeah, which is a shame on Google <laughs> for for producing such bad AI. But okay, okay. So what else more do they have in here? Um, yeah, like I say, no GCC. What the heck? Where is the GCC? I don't find it. Like I say, there is no G. GCC, so so I don't really know if it if it's the LM contributing to it or not. Okay, maybe this ablation study should help somehow. Okay, so what is a SEG? Okay, synergistic cross modal embedding generation and predictive embedding generation. SEG and PEG. Okay. So if you take out the MOE, you get an increase of error. Okay, right, right. So essentially, what I think this is trying to say, right? Yeah, I think this ablation is a uh, what I need to know, right? So, okay, right. It does have G, GCC in here, right, implicitly. But 
they could have placed this entire thing above, right? Because it's one of the most important information in order to know if it even works or not. Mm. Okay, so so there's more information here. There's a lot of information here. Um, right. Okay. Let's see. A uh, scaffold random. Okay. Right. And they show that if you use a random, it's gonna be worse. So it is recommended that you use scaffold. And obviously, the more sound, the more input output pairs you have, the better the accuracy is going to be. The lower the mean absolute error is going to be. Right. So, so that's uh, common sense. Uh, and they investigate the embedding sizes, right, and how it affects the accuracy. Well, do you have to, have to do some kind of a hyperparameter search in order to find that out? But that's not really that interesting. So yeah, okay, right. And they have some examples of the problems that they use, right? So as you can already tell, a lot of these outputs are pretty long. Right, so it's like a whole, it's like two passage worth of words, right? So it's pretty long and they have to, yeah. So I would say this is a very expensive approach to improve uh, the, the accuracy of molecular property prediction. Well, if it works in the first place, right? And the sad part about this is that they don't provide any code, unfortunately, right? But yeah, so, so yeah, that's my, yeah. And that's it from my side. So uh, yeah, it's, yeah, so it's a pretty impressive results from the paper, but I really do hope that uh, there's a code implementation for this work, but I don't see it coming out soon anyway, because I couldn't find any real indications of that happening anytime soon. So yeah, yeah. Uh, if you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you all in the next one. Bye.